talk about uh, the thermodynamics of irreversible processes. And the idea here is to sort of take one step into kinetic theory, but not actually dealing with kinetic theory at all, but trying to extrapolate thermodynamics into the domain of kinetics. So let me once again explain to you uh, the different states of equilibrium that we have with this mechanical analogy. So here we have a, a ball in a, in a valley here, and the definition of equilibrium is that if I give it a tiny perturbation, and by tiny I mean an infinitesimal perturbation, the ball will come back to its original position. So there is absolutely no tendency for change. If you observe this system for a long enough time, you will see no change. Although, of course, we are looking at macroscopic uh, phenomena, on a microscopic scale, there might be a dynamic equilibrium. That means there are some atoms moving uh, into a lower energy state, other mo atoms moving back, and so forth. But overall, there is no change. So that's uh, the meaning of equilibrium. This is metastable equilibrium, where basically we haven't reached the global minimum. Now, we don't know what the global minimum would be, uh, and the fact is that all the theory for a metastable equilibrium is the, exactly the same as for stable equilibrium here. So there's no real difference, as far as we are concerned, between metastable equilibrium and uh, this kind of a situation. Unstable equilibrium, if I give this a tiny perturbation, an infinitesimal perturbation, then it will tend to reduce its free energy. But if I don't disturb it, it will remain at that point. Now, this is a state which is unlike any of these. Okay. Uh, what is the key difference, do you think, here, in terms of the thermodynamic parameters that you have? What is happening? Exactly. Here, we are dissipating free energy. Dissipating means we, we are basically uh, this is going down this hill because it's going to lower and lower energy states and therefore we are dissipating free energy all the time. So this is no longer thermodynamics. In all of these cases we are not dissipating any free energy. This is in the realm of kinetics. Okay. We want to know the speeds of reactions and so forth. But let's just think again because there are two kinds of kinetic states. This again is the equilibrium state, and you can see here two processes which are different in which we are dissipating free energy. Both of these we are dissipating free energy. Can you see a difference between those two? The way we dissipate free energy. Yeah. Well, well uh, here you see, I mean, this, this is curved, isn't it? Uh, so if I'm standing on that ball while it's falling, I would actually see things changing around me. Yeah, because the slope here is different from the slope here. This is what we call steady state, where if you are located on the ball, even though we are dissipating free energy, you don't see much of a difference. Around you, you see the same thing. Yeah, so that's called steady steady. And another example which you are, might be more familiar with of a steady state process is that, look, if I have a temperature gradient here across these two walls, so this is at T1 and this is at T2, and the temperatures at these points are not changing, and this will, we've got heat flowing down this gradient, but if these temperatures are not changing, then the temperature distribution inside that slab is not changing, right? So that's again a steady state process, we are dissipating heat. But if you are an observer located at any point in here, you don't see any change. The temperature on the left-hand side is the same as the temperature on the right-hand side, yeah. even though heat is flowing. So that's another steady state process. Of course, if, uh, if the far field temperature here was altering, you know, if it reduced or increased, then you would see a change happening, and that's no longer a steady state process. So today we are going to treat the steady state process and treat that only using thermodynamics because we are going to use the approximation that look if an observer is located on that ball, they don't see any change. And that's a little bit like equilibrium. And if we observe this system for a long time, there will be no 
change that you notice. So everyone happy with that? Yeah. Um, we we to suggest that it's steady state because the uh, initial and end points are fixed. But I would have thought that it depends on the, on the shape of the tensor ridge. So right. Rather than the endpoints. I mean, I've drawn this diagram uh, here. Heat flow is only being driven by the difference between T1 and T2. Yeah. Now, you could say that, look, if the thermal conductivity here depends on temperature, I might get, instead of this straight line, I might get a curve, mm -hmm. and so forth. So yes, you're right. But do you understand the meaning of steady state? Is that if I'm located uh, somewhere in here, or if I'm located on this board, I would actually see no change in my environment, even though all the time free energy is being reduced. Okay. I'll give you some more examples of steady state processes in a short while. Now, the title slide also had this word irreversible processes. And I want to explain to you what that means, what an irreversible process means. An irreversible process is one whose direction can be altered uh, by a very small change in the, uh, cannot be altered by a very small change in the external conditions. So a process whose direction can be changed by an infinitesimal change in external conditions is called a reversible process. So to give you a mechanical analogy again, imagine that we have a cylinder here and a piston and a gas in here. And the relationship between pressure and volume is given by this curve. If this is a completely frictionless piston, then if I make a small, very small change in pressure, I will simply follow this curve to get the volume. There's no actual free energy dissipated in this process. Small change here, to increase the pressure, and I will decrease the volume, staying on this curve. By contrast, if I introduce friction into this, um, then I will be dissipating free energy by rubbing the piston against the wall of the cylinder. And that is a process which is called irreversible. So I start to raise the pressure at this point. Nothing happens because there's friction. I should really, as soon as I start raising the pressure, I should move down this curve, but nothing happens because of friction. And then the piston starts moving as I overcome the friction force, so I follow this curve here. When I start to release the pressure, again, nothing happens. The piston doesn't reverse itself because there's a friction force. So I follow this curve and finally get back to this point again. Now, can you tell me what the free energy is dissipated? in this process? What free energy is dissipated in this process? On this graph, what identifies the amount mm -hmm. of free energy dissipated? Yeah? Area. area. This area here. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I started from this point, I went along <coughs> here, ended up at this point. If there's nothing dissipated, then I would simply have followed this curve down here. But actually, I've done work against friction, and that's what we call an irreversible process. One in which free energy is dissipated. Happy? Okay. Uh, let me first of all make a statement, a general statement, about irreversible processes, and then I will go on to explain the origins of these statements. Okay. So, the first statement is a really important statement is that in any irreversible process where free energy is dissipated, I can write an equation like this, where this is temperature, this is the rate of entropy production, this is a flux and this is a force. So in any irreversible process, any irreversible process, that means one in which free energy is dissipated, the rate 
of energy dissipation. is temperature times sigma, where sigma is the rate of entropy production. So this is the rate of entropy production. So there's nothing nothing new so far. You know, if I multiply temperature by the rate of entropy production, that gives me the rate of energy dissipation, doesn't it? The, the sort of statement I'm trying to get you to accept is that if I work out the total rate of energy dissipation, then I can write it as the product of a flux and a force. Okay, so this is a, a flux and this is a force. So whatever process you're thinking about, there will be something which drives it, and that's what we call the force. Yeah, in, in that temperature gradient that I drew, it was a difference in temperature that relates to the force. And the flux, what would be the flux in that process? It's the flow of heat. So we have some kind of a flow and some kind of a force. In any process which is dissipating free energy, if we work out the rate of free energy dissipation, then we can write it as the product of a flux and a force. <coughs> so that is probably the most important statement of the thermodynamics of irreversible processes. And I'm going to give you some examples now. And I'd like you to participate and tell me what the force is and what the flux is. Now here is uh, an electrical current which is flowing down a circuit which has a resistance R and uh, the value of the current is measured with an ammeter and this is a voltage here. So what is the force and what is the flux in this case? Well, the force is the voltage. Yes, the electromotive force, sometimes called the electromotive force, and the flux, current. Now, do you know the relationship between voltage and current? What's it called? We have the relationship here that you know the current is proportional to Ohm's law. Ohm's law, right? Yeah. Now, you find that whenever you can write an equation like this, J is proportional to X. That's an empirical result that when you write an equation like this, J will be proportional to X. So in this case, we have the current being proportional to the voltage, right? And that's Ohm's law. So again, this is just an empirical statement at this stage, that when you write the rate of en uh, entropy production times temperature, which is the free energy dissipation rate, you can write it as the product of a flux and a force, and you find that the flux is actually proportional to the force. And in the case of electrical current, that is Ohm's law. <coughs> so let's let's just uh, prove that, uh, and the proof. I'm putting in inverted commas. Supposing I take my flux J, which is some function of a force. At the moment, let's not assume that it's proportional to the force, but it is some function of the force. Uh, I can expand it into a Taylor expansion. Uh, and I'm going to expand it about the value of x equal to zero. So of course, I have here the first term in the Taylor expansion, which is the flux at zero force. I have uh, the second term. Uh, here we have the force over one factorial and this is the derivative of this function, the first derivative of this function. And then we have the second derivative of the function and x squared over two factorial and so on. I, ca I can carry on using as many terms as I like, can't I? That's the meaning of a Taylor expansion. Everybody happy with that? <coughs> 
Now, can you help me to simplify this equation? What do you do normally with a Taylor expansion to make it simple? Well, you get rid of the terms that approximate zero. Sorry? Eliminate the high terms. Yeah. So, uh, assuming that, you know, the, the force is small, you can say terms in x squared, x cubed, etc. will be very small, and therefore we can get rid of them. Any other simplification? I want to be left with just one term, right? So this, we've got to eliminate another term. Assume the first one is also zero. Yeah. This one is zero, why? Because there we don't have any blocks in this case, we have no force. Brilliant. So the first term disappears. And what have we recovered here? We've recovered this equation, haven't we? That, look, the <coughs> flux is proportional to the force. Okay. Now, this also highlights, of course, that we are making an approximation when we say that the flux is proportional to the force. Th this, of course, is, there's no approximation there. But by eliminating higher order terms, you are saying that this law must apply over a limited range of forces. So if you have Ohm's law and you put an incredibly high voltage, maybe Ohm's law won't work. So this relationship applies over a limited range of force, in other words, not a very large deviation from equilibrium. And that's the domain in which this theory works. I can't tell you what the range of x is beyond which the relationship won't work. That you have to determine experimentally. Okay, you have to see deviation from linearity. The so Ohm's law won't necessarily work if you go to very high voltages. Now this is very difficult to test experimentally because if you go to very high voltages, you also get very high currents and the thing heats up, which has a different effect on resistance and so forth. But you can do it by putting a very, very high spike of voltage, a very temporary spike of voltage, so that you don't get the heating effect and try to find deviation from Ohm's law. So let me just summarize. An irreversible process is one which dissipates free energy. And we can write the rate of dissipation as temperature times the rate of entropy production. And that is a product of a flux and a force, because current times voltage is actually energy per unit time, isn't it? What are the units of current times voltage? Joules per second. Yeah, so that's energy dissipation rate. And when we can write an equation like this, we find that J is proportional to X up to a point. And beyond that point, the theory that we are talking about doesn't work. But we can't a priori say that the theory will only work in this range. We have to discover that experimentally. Everybody happy with that? Okay, let's go a bit further. So this is now heat flow. What is the force and the flux? <coughs> yeah, the uh, force is the temperature gradient, and the flux is the heat flow. What is the product? Uh, wh what are the units of the heat flow times the temperature gradient? What is the law relating heat flow and gradient called? Do you, does that, do you know You know the Ohm's law equivalent of heat flow? Fourier's law of heat diffusion. And if you work it out, you know the product uh, of the flux and the force will give you an energy per unit time, crossing a, a unit area of material. And again, you would expect this to break down if you went to very large temperature gradients. These are all empirical laws, by the way. You know, things like Ohm's law, Fourier's law, Fix's law of diffusion. They're all empirical equations. This is uh, the corresponding law for um, diffusion, where we have a diffusion flux being proportional to concentration gradient here. And this is the diffusion coefficient. And this is called Fix's law. Now if I multiply the 
flux of matter by the concentration gradient, I don't actually get the right units here, which are joules per second. And that's because this equation is actually wrong. Yeah? It's too empirical. What we should have is a free energy gradient here, rather than a concentration gradient. And we'll be doing that in the kinetics lectures when we come to it, that this is an approximation and only works when the concentration gradient is parallel to the free energy gradient. But sometimes we can get matter diffusing against a concentration gradient because that is with a free energy gradient. We'll come to that in, in the kinetics lectures. But if I replace that with the free energy gradient, then obviously multiplying the flux by the free energy gradient will give me the right units of joules per second. Again, you, you can expect Fix's law to break down when the concentration gradient or free energy gradient becomes very steep. And there are really good examples of that because sometimes we create multi-layered materials where we have a, a, a monolayer of gold, a monolayer of copper, monolayer of gold, copper, etc. So there are huge gradients there, the biggest gradient you can ever get. And there, you find Fix's law will break down. It won't work. So, this is just a summary of the different kinds of forces and flux with electrical current. We have the voltage or electromotive force, heat flux, we have this term, diffusion flux, we have the free energy gradient. And if you are deforming a material uh, at a certain strain rate, then stress is the force which drives that strain, and the product of these two will again be joules per second. Right, so supposing now we have a situation in which we don't have just one force acting, but more than one force. So for example, if we are thinking of the diffusion of matter, we might have a free energy gradient because of a concentration gradient, but we might also have a temperature gradient. And both of those processes will dissipate free energy because the temperature gradient will cause heat flow and the free energy gradient will cause mass flow. Well, that, that's not a problem. Again, if we write the total free energy dissipation rate here, and equations which include all the forces and fluxes, so I equals 1 could correspond to concentration changes, I equals 2 could correspond to temperature changes, uh, then we will find that the flux is proportional to all the forces, not just to one force. So, for example, if this is now the diffusion flux, it will not only depend on the concentration gradient, but also on the temperature gradient. And these will be the coefficients relating the flux to all the different forces. So, just to expand that equation, we have J1, supposing we have two forces, X1 and X2, then the first flux will depend not just on x1, but also on x2. So this is an interaction coefficient, if you like. And similarly, j2 will also depend on x1 and its own force, x2. So supposing that I have a situation in which I have a gradient of manganese in a particular material, say iron. But the carbon concentration is uniform. Then even though the carbon concentration is uniform, it will tend to diffuse because of the gradient in manganese. So you could think of this as the force of manganese and the force due to carbon. So carbon will tend to diffuse even though this is zero because of this being finite. So carbon will redistribute even if you start with a uniform concentration. So this is a very powerful uh, uh, set of equations. We can now find the flux due to all the forces, not just a single force. Now if you think about what's happening microscopically, then the forward and reverse processes should occur at the same rate. Uh, when, when, when we are 
when we have any flux, we should have, supposing we reverse the direction of the force, then we should expect things to happen at the same rate as when the flux uh, force was in the other direction. And that is the principle of microscopic reversibility, which tells us that Mij will be equal to Mji. So for example, this coefficient here will be equal to this coefficient here. There is one exception, and that is when we have magnetic fields. If you reverse the direction of the magnetic field, we've got to change the sign of the coefficient. Now, this might all seem abstract to you, but you have everyday examples where you find a flux is related to several forces, and I'll give you a couple of those examples. This is, uh, this is the opposite of a thermocouple. A thermocouple is when you have two pieces of metal, you put them into a solution which is at a different temperature to a reference, and you generate an electrical potential, don't you? So there you have a temperature difference generating an electrical potential. And that comes exactly from, from these equations here. That if this is the electrical current, and this is the voltage, this is zero, but we have a temperature difference which generates the electrical current. That's how a thermocouple works. Okay. You can do the opposite. You can use a temperature difference here to drive a motor. Yeah, so again, we have temperature differences generating electrical current. Alternatively, if you've been to WH Smith's recently, you'll be able to find a very small refrigerator yeah, for about five pounds. You can buy this refrigerator. So you can keep your single Coke can cold. The way that works is that um, you generate a temperature difference by an electrical current. So that's called the Peltier effect. You're, you're passing a current down these two different kinds of metal, and therefore you generate a temperature difference. There are no moving parts there. It's a solid state refrigerator. It's the opposite of a thermocouple. Uh, you have the phenomenon of electromigration. You might have heard of that. So when you make electronic devices, you place things very close to each other, don't you? You know, you want to pack in as many devices as possible into a very small volume of material. Because they are very close, you have large electrical potential differences between adjacent points. That will drive chemical diffusion and eventually ruin your device. That's called electromigration. So that's diffusion driven by a potential difference. So these interactions between forces and all, uh, between all kinds of forces and a particular flux are very common throughout everything that we do. We just don't notice them very frequently. Okay? And they all come from this set of equations. So that is irreversible thermodynamics. And you can see how we've used kinetic theory, just sticking to thermodynamics. These forces will be proportional to the fluxes up to a point beyond which you cannot use this theory and you have to go into the domain of kinetic theory. This is as far as you can go using thermodynamics alone. Do you have any questions? <coughs> We'll be doing one more example of this when we come to the kinetic theory, where you see that this works only up to a certain point. We'll derive a rigorous equation relating flux and force, and we will show that it only becomes a linear dependence when the force is small. Good, thank you very much.